Let's bring in pollster and former senior advisor to Scott Walker and Mitt Romney presidential campaigns, Ed Goes. Good to have you this morning, Ed. Glad to be here, Sandra. How are you? All right. I'm very good, thank you. Uh, so last week, a lot of people have described last week, even his, even his strongest challengers have said, that was a pretty good week for Trump. What did you make of it? I think it was a good week. I think one of the things, uh, as we've talked about before, there is a, a range that Trump is coming in in terms of the ballot. Uh, same thing for Hillary. Uh, I think what we saw in the weeks before is he had been driven down to the bottom of that range and she was at the top. And I think what we saw last week is things began moving more towards the center. Uh, with the uh, average of all the polls right now having Hillary up a little bit more than five points, which is about where the race really is. Well, yeah, um, and I mean, here we are 77 days uh, till Election Day, and you've got Paul Manafort out. During this, what was described by many as uh, one of the best weeks for the Trump campaign, you had Paul Manafort out, and that was sort of a distraction because everybody said, uh-oh, what's happening behind closed doors that they're <laughs> shaking things up? But enter Stephen Bannon and Kellyanne Conway, who's coming up in this show, by the way. Uh, what does this shakeup tell us? What does it mean for the campaign well, going forward? I, I think a couple of things. Uh, the unique thing about this election year is with both candidates having such high negatives, it is the opposite of what it usually is. Uh, a focus on Trump too much drives his negatives up and drives his numbers down. The same is true for Hillary Clinton. I think what we saw last week was that they began to take a step back put more of a focus on Hillary Clinton and, and didn't have him driving the message. I mean, Kellyanne is a, a, a very qualified, very competent, very good spokesman for the Trump campaign. And I think through this transition, the focus was more on her driving the message than Trump. And I think that allowed the pressure to kind of be taken out of the race and uh, in terms of the negatives towards Trump and allowed him to surface. And then you have Eric out there saying things, which is exactly right. His speech to North Carolina showed some humbleness that, quite frankly, many of those, uh, many of us have been waiting to see in the campaign. And I think it plays to his positives. Now, the campaign can stay on that focus, which I believe they can. I think you'll see those numbers close even more. And what do you make of uh, Donald Trump's fundraising efforts and his position financially in this camp campaign? You know, that's a tough, camp a tough thing. I mean, Hillary's been putting together the right operation, the Clinton operation, uh, for, for years in terms of fundraising. Uh, he's kind of behind the, 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 the eight ball on that and has actually been saying, I don't need as much money. Uh, that's not necessarily true, and I think they're finally getting some focus on raising more money, raising more money into the RNC so that they can do the things right. the committee should be doing, like voter ID and turnout. I, I just saw, yeah. I'll add, she, ha she and her allies had $140 million in the bank in July. Trump had $78 million. So, right. I, again, $78 million is a ton of money for him to raise in a few months and have socked away, but he's got a long way and to go. And we wanted to get this in there about uh, funding coming from Silicon Valley. The Republican Party, Ed, has uh, strengthened ties to the wealthy tech community in Silicon Valley. According to the Wall Street Journal, Donald Trump has not made the same effort and his campaign has received little fundraising support from Silicon Valley. PayPal co-founder uh, Peter Thiel gave a primetime speech, as we know, during the RNC, but has not donated directly to Trump and doesn't have any plans to fundraise for his campaign. Is this sort of lack of support from Silicon Valley a concern for the Republican Party and for Trump's campaign? Well, I, I, I think as you saw his numbers come down after the convention and the race start edging towards a double-digit uh, double lead for Hillary Clinton, I think you saw a lot of those, those uh, supporters, those traditional fundraisers for the Republican Party, along with areas like, like the Silicon Valley, begin to take a step back. I think uh, that it's a, it's a one-two step here. He has to get back in the game. Uh, which I think he's doing, and then I think you'll see uh, the, the the financial people say, "Okay, I'm seeing a real campaign here. I'll step forward." And I just want to want to point something out about Silicon Valley, though, is is hugely liberal, and that's a generalization. Yes. But you have some rhetoric going on, and you see it on Facebook, and I see it with people communicating with each other, where people literally will say, "If you vote for Trump, you're hurting my children. You're hurting my children's future." And there there starts to get this weird implied business issue of if I find out you voted for Trump, I'm not going to do business with you. And it's <laughs> kind of insidious. Well, uh, that happens in every campaign. I mean, quite frankly, uh, uh, one of the swing votes uh, that I've seen out there, quite frankly, are married men, which are uh, white married men, which are traditionally uh, lean Republican in their voting, with children at home. And, and they have been dealing with this issue of 
how Trump is out there, his persona out there. I mean, I've always thought there are two things that the Trump campaign has to do. One mm -hmm. is, yes, they have to stay in message. But the other is they have to bring it down a notch or two in terms of what drives his negatives, which is his persona. Ed Morgan Ortegas is here. Yeah, Ed, good morning. Hey, morning. One of the things that I'm worried about for the long-term future of the party beyond this election is the millennial vote. And recent polling has showed that millennials actually choose Donald Trump fourth behind Gary Johnson and Jill Stein. So are you worried about that, or do you think that this is normally what happens with young people as it relates to Republicans in, in an election? And can Trump make up some of that youth vote between now and November? I think you can make it up. Again, uh, I think everyone keeps looking for big, big jumps in terms of the data when, when the, the name ID is so high for both of these candidates that what you're seeing is they're w both working within a range. And if the focus is on Hillary Clinton, we have an opportunity to reach out to some of those voters who are not favorable towards her either. Um, but the focus has to be on Hillary, not on him. Uh, if the focus becomes on him, then the job becomes that much tougher. And I think what you are seeing from the campaign is the beginning of a realization that the message can't solely be driven by mm -hmm. Donald Trump with his persona that, that grabs some, some media attention, mm -hmm. but in fact works against his neighbors. All right, well, let's talk about this, Ed. Uh, former Secretary of State Colin Powell speaking out about Hillary Clinton's email scandal, uh, really getting in the mix here. Powell telling reporters over the weekend, quote, her people have been trying to pin it on me, Powell went on to say. <laughs> the truth is she was using the private email server for a year before I sent her a memo telling her what I did. Ed, she put it out that he said before she engaged in using a private server, she made it out that he said, well, I did this, you can do this. Well, she had already been doing this. What do you make of him saying, they're trying to pin all this on me? Well, I think he's exactly right, and I think they, they, they are in the same situation. Uh, as Trump is, if they keep the focus, anything that brings the focus back on her negatives is going to drive her numbers down. And trying to fix the email problem, rather than realizing the fact of the matter is, those numbers are already baked into her negatives. So any discussion about that, any type of excuse making on that, mm -hmm. is only going to make the situation worse. I know, you know, and as Basil Smichael said at the top of our six o'clock hour this morning, come on, you guys have been talking about this email thing for so long. But hey, there's but a lot of unanswered questions. She does. She's the one who sure. keeps it alive with her misstatements. Fair That's enough. Or lies. Right. Or lies. <laughs> <laughs> she hasn't had a press conference. Lying about it. She hasn't really said anything. Oh, yes. In the lack of press conference. Yes. That's another story. All right, Ed Goes, thank you. Thank you very much.